Hi, everyone. Welcome to week 18. Just took the uh, 18th shot and again, side effects now have gone away completely. Up to about a few weeks ago, I just felt a little nauseous, not very much for about two hours after the shot. And as I found out camping, I also tend to be a little low energy, but today it's nothing. And so I'm starting to get this idea, which maybe people who have been on this for a while understand. Side effects and almost good effects go a little bit hand in hand. Maybe not for every person. I read different experiences from everyone on um, Reddit and things like that. But I lost 0.9 pounds. Again, not spectacular. Okay, it's better than 0.2, which was last week. But that brings the whole month, I think, to like 4.2. And I think that's even with the 2.8 loss that I had right at the beginning of the month. So it is in a definite stall. And I did contact my doctor, like I said last week, and he approved for me to move up to 7.5. A little bit nervous about it, I have to tell you, because I read, and I should not read, but I read that a lot of people start having bigger side effects at 7.5. I fundamentally feel that I've been able to avoid side effects because I've been doing everything correctly as best I can, eating the right foods, getting the right amount of sleep, taking it at a good time where I don't see people for a little bit. And so I feel like I have that part managed. So I'm hoping whatever happens when I start taking 7.5, not next week, but the week after, that I will be able to figure out and troubleshoot. I'm, I'm a software troubleshooter by heart and figure out what exactly is going wrong and how I can fix it. I had some stomach woes after camping, fixed it. Strangely enough, a pear and an apple every day made the whole thing better. Whatever comes, I hope I'll be able to fix that too. But I also hear a lot of people like 7.5 because they tend to have really good weight loss with it. I want to have a big winter of weight loss. I want to really focus on losing weight and, and dropping those pounds because I want to start off March, like I said last time, powered. Next week, I am going to be speaking at a college campus. And I hope I will be able to do a video when I get home. I might record half the video tonight, which will be the hopefully the finishing part of regrets. But I won't know what I weigh. And so maybe I'll just tack that on as best I can. I'll check my software. and I'm pretty sure there's probably a way of doing that. But I'm going away to a conference. I'm speaking at the conference. And that's going to be nice because I'm down a good number of sizes. I'm down... I never understood if I'm down from this number to that number and it's four numbers, I think it's actually two sizes. I think that's how it goes. You know, like if you went from 18 to 14, that's just two sizes. That's not four sizes. See, I'm, I'm terrible at this, but I am down. And so a lot of clothes, again, went out the door last week and I went into my closet. I got a ladder because I have this cubby hole at the very top of my closet and it was stuffed full of clothes. So I went through all of those clothes, put them in order of sizes, and I have more jeans. I have more clothes to wear. I have a ton of clothes to wear. I bought myself a couple of shirts just because, you know, reward and being nice to myself. And I like some of these shirts that are out there. I typically wear these life is good shirts because that kind of wraps up my whole feeling about almost everything. And so I bought a few of those, but I have plenty of clothes that are going to last me. And in fact, I have clothes that will go all the way down to size 16. So I have already buzzed through quickly the two sizes I had in my closet before. Then I put the next level of sizes in my closet when I checked out the last set of clothes, and I'm already past those two. They are already getting to be a little bit big. Had to actually even go out and buy a couple pairs of jeans because I didn't have jeans in this one size. Like I said, I'm good all the way down to size 16, except this one size. I must have not stayed there very long the last time I lost weight. So I did get a couple pairs of jeans just because I needed those. And next week, I'm going to wear some dress pants that also fit in this whole range of sizes down all the way to the end. This speech is very formal, and it's to a college. So it'll be fun, and it'll be nice. And it'll make me feel better, I think, standing up in front of people weighing less. It sometimes is a little bit weird for me now because I don't see the weight loss when I look in the mirror. It's really the weirdest experience. And I didn't the last time either. But when I was at the gym the other day, I did look in the mirror and I thought, wow, I really did lose some weight. Oh, I also bought some smaller gym clothes. But one time I was looking at my ring doorbell camera and I saw someone walking around my driveway. I'm like, oh, 
is that? Oh, it was me. I didn't even recognize me walking around in my driveway, which is good news. That's another non-scale kind of benefit going on there. I have oral surgery, so my mouth is going to be really sore. And then the next day I take 7.5 and I'm not probably going to feel like eating much of anything until my mouth starts feeling better and I overcome whatever is going to happen with 7.5. Better get some soup or something like that. And up here in the North Woods, it's starting to get wintry, so I'm starting to feel, oh, you know, all cozy inside. And like I said, looking forward to having that big impact winter so that I can lose weight, get into spring, and start doing all the things I hope to do. So strangely enough, we've been talking about regrets. And apparently I have a lot of things to say about regrets. I did two podcast episodes in Start With Small Steps. That's the name of my podcast. Episode 165 and 166, I covered Dan Pink's book, the power of regrets. What is it that makes regret benefit us? And he, the subtitle of the book is How Backwards Moves Us Forward. Now, Dan Pink is always good. I always like all of his books. They're well-written. They're well-thought-out. They're well-researched. The point he talked about in his book was there was a whole movement. It was a Nike shirt, no regrets. We weren't supposed to have regrets, and we were supposed to get rid of regrets and just keep moving and keep going forward. And He, like I, think that that was such a bad move because regrets make us better as long as we use them in the proper way. So, for example, if you don't have regrets and you trounced over your spouse or your best friend and then you don't apologize, kind of makes you a jerk and your relationship might be hurt by it. If you don't have regrets, you might fall into the same rut over and over again and you won't know how to fix it because you refuse to look backwards to the point where you can figure out what went wrong. I don't believe in dwelling in our regrets, making them oh, a negative experience, making us sit there in this rut thinking about what a horrible person we are. And so even Dan Pink himself says it helps at times to get a little bit of distance on it. There are some other ways that you can think about regrets in the sense that you can pretend like your best friend was telling you this regret. Well, I ate a whole cheesecake. I have never eaten a whole cheesecake, but you know what I mean. If your best friend came to you and said, oh, Jill, I just ate a whole cheesecake. You know what I'd say to her? I'd say, you know what, dude? It's okay. Tomorrow, new day. We're not going to eat a cheesecake tomorrow. We're going to start off right, and we're going to start correcting this behavior. You're not going to fix it in a day. Because whatever led to you eating the cheesecake might still be living inside of you, but we're going to start working towards your emotions, the things that led you down this path. That's what I would tell my best friend. But when it happened to us, we don't talk to ourselves like we talk to our best friends. We're cruel, we're negative, we get into ruts. So one way to get around it is pretend that your best friend just told you what you have a regret about. Or imagine it was on a TV show, or if you could find a TV show that had a similar regret. What did people say? How did they talk about it? What did that person do? Making it sort of seem third person will help you get away a little bit of distance from it. And if you still can't get any distance from it, give it a little bit of time. Don't tell yourself that you have to solve this problem right now. Give it a little bit of time so you can get past the emotions, the negative emotions about it. In the end, that's what we have to do is that we have to go through this process of trying to look at our regrets with a little bit less emotion and more third person analytical. If we were a scientist studying this regret, what would we say about it? The emotion, again, is just not going to help us. Regrets can be very negative. There was a study that was done that talked about people who were Olympic winners and who had the most regrets. Well, the gold winner didn't have any regrets because they won gold. The bronze winner usually felt great, like, oh, I just got in. I just got into the meddling thing. I feel pretty good about this. It was the silver winner because they almost had gold. They don't feel like they almost dropped out of the meddling piece, but they miss getting gold by. Sometimes almost getting our goals can make us have bigger regrets than just not even coming close. But again, regrets can make us a lot better because shows you the pathways you take. I tend to be an overly optimistic person. So I know this about myself. And so when I go into a situation and I'll say, oh, I should buy this 
thing for my car. I can certainly build this, right? Of course I can. It'll be fine. Mm, Jill, sometimes you're a little bit more positive about your ability to build things than actually is true. Now, because I've looked at past regrets, I understand about myself a little bit more, and I know that I can tend to be a little bit over-optimistic about things. Or, let's take the pandemic. I was heavily addicted into video games for a decade. I played a game called EverQuest to extreme, to where it was taking over my entire life. This is how I actually put on a good chunk of weight from what I was in college to what I ended up getting to when I tried to lose weight the first time, primarily from playing too many video games. And suddenly the pandemic comes along, and because I thought about it long and hard about my old video game habits, my first thought was when this pandemic happened was, oh, I should go buy a new video game. This is going to be, you know, stuck in the house for a while. And then I realized, Jill, this is the rut you fall into all the time. You go when you're stressed, or you go when you're bored, and you go in and you immediately start playing video games, and then suddenly it's a decade later. And I decided no video games. And I started I, doing other things. My podcast all started because Allison at Nozilla Cast Podcast got me started in podcasting. I started sewing again. And I started doing all sorts of things that I didn't know I needed to do. I took a spare bedroom and I turned it into a recording studio. Then I took the other spare bedroom and I turned it into a gym. I took all that gym equipment that you buy and never use. I got rubbery floor mats. I put them down on the, the floor of this room, and then I put all of the gym equipment in there and then left a big space in the middle because I also have an Oculus. A lot of exercise things I do with Oculus. Someday I should really talk about that. But I wanted some space so that I could do that. I made a fantastic gym. Then I took on the walls. I put all sorts of positive reinforcements, adventures I wanted to have, and ideas and workout plans. And then I put a TV and a way to watch things, you know, on there. This is great. My gym is great now. And I don't have to go and pay a, a fee for another gym. It has really been a big experience in my life. And then the other thing is that you have to realize from Dan Pink, he says that you have to use these regrets to be a catalyst for future behavior. If you don't use your regrets to... One, apologize for whatever you did. Two, come up with new ideas about what went wrong in your past. For me, it had been being overly positive. It had been not thinking that I could actually get my goals, which actually seemed contradictory, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Or getting stuck playing video games. And those were mistakes I'd made, and it changed my behavior when I needed to make a decision about what I was going to do during the pandemic. And so it has to go ahead and help us to become better. When it came to the financial thing, this was what was funny, is I did not believe I was going to make it to retirement. I wasn't saving enough money. I wasn't doing anything. And I didn't have any money. I, I was just broke all the time. But using small steps, I went through and solved my budget problem, got my bills paid off, and then started saving for my retirement and while it's not going to be the land of luxury for Jill here in retirement land, I'm not going to eat dog food either. It's going to be okay. Well, dog food's really expensive. But I wish I would have thought I could have made an impact earlier in my life. For me, I had to make a ton more money. I can't, I can't get my goals because I need something big to happen in my life. And unfortunately, I, I wouldn't do anything about it. But instead... I learned that by taking these small steps, I could pay off my bills. And by taking more small steps, I could start adding to my retirement fund. Through the magic of compound interest, it all came out okay. You know, it, and then the last part about regrets that makes things positive is that quote that says, when was the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. What's the second time to plant a tree today? You can think about all the things that you wish you would have done, all the things that you wished you would have changed about your life, and you wish you would have done it 20 years ago so you could be having the benefits of all those things that you did. But unfortunately, you can't go back in time. So the best thing that you can do is start today. So regrets should be a push for you to get going now. In the book about regrets, there's two types of regrets that are out there. 
There's ones about things that you did that you should not have done. And there are things that you should not have done that you should. And there are things that you didn't do that you should have done. And it gets confusing because let's say when I was broke, I went and I took a very high luxury vacation, went into debt, spent all my credit card money on going on this big vacation. Now I'm broke and now I have all these credit card bills. And what if I lost my job, you know, or something like that? I didn't do any of these things, but you can see now I have a regret that I did something I shouldn't have done. Then comes the regret that maybe you're now older and maybe one of my legs were broken. I didn't break my legs, but when my ankles were not working, I had a lot of regrets thinking, oh, I should have done things when I was younger and my ankles weren't going to break and had these adventures. So then there's the, the regret of not doing something. But the question is, you can't go back in time. We don't have time machines to see how they turn out. Maybe you blew all your money on a big vacation long ago, got yourself in debt, but eventually you paid it off. It worked out. Or maybe you didn't go on the vacation. You saved the money and something happened like I blew up my ankles and then suddenly I never got to go and I never got to do these things. It tends to be that Younger people have regrets about things they did, and older people have regrets about things they didn't do. It's kind of interesting. I heard a great quote from Mick Jagger about this, which is funny. I didn't suspect he was deep, but the past is a great place. I don't want to erase it or regret it. I don't want to be its prisoner either. That's the point, is that we have regrets, either positive or negative. Let's just not dwell in them. Let it teach us something. Let us make it more beneficial to us so that we can go on and move on about our things. And then next week, and then I'll probably record it tonight, just so you know, is we'll talk a little bit about more things that we can do about regrets, other ways that we can tackle them and think about them. One thing I thought was interesting about regrets in general, when I was in college, there was a professor that came along my sophomore year in my undergraduate, and she came late in the year. So all the TAs, the Uh, grad school students were taken. And I went to her and I said, hey, could I be your TA since you don't have anyone? And she's like, sure, you got it. I was a sophomore and I was her TA. So I was grading papers and I was teaching her classes when she was gone and on speaking tours. I was helping her with her, her research and got really a good deep dive into psychology research. And one thing I learned about that was kind of interesting is about attribution error. And we all tend to have an attribution error. We tend to think that the good things in our lives happen because I'm great. I I did a great job. Everything's going great because I'm talented. But when things don't go great, then we say, well, that that jerk over there caused me to fail. The economy tanked right when I was going to start my business. And so that's why my business didn't take off. It's always someone else's fault when things go wrong. But when people suffer from depression, like clinical depression, it flips. So that means that when something goes right, they just say, oh, I just got lucky. And when it goes poorly, it's all my fault. I'm not very good. Attribution errors are part of the way we think. And you have to catch yourself in thinking these things because it will turn regrets into a nuclear warhead against your life. So once you can tackle these attribution errors, you'll be able to do a lot better for dealing with your regrets. So next week, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about regrets, and then hopefully we'll get off the regrets issue. We'll talk about some other things. Give it some thought over the next week about some regrets that you have, and how are you thinking about them, and how is your flawed thinking putting them maybe in the wrong basket with the wrong kind of attribution error? Also think, too, are are there trends? Or do you, like me, I trend towards playing video games when I shouldn't. I tend to think I can't make impact unless I can do something big. Me, I tend to look at things overly positive, and sometimes it puts me in a bad situation. You know, think about that a little bit more, about if you can kind of group those together and understand a bit more about how some of your decision-making might be leading you astray. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please remember, you can email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. That is the website also for my podcast, Start With Small Steps. And you can look at any podcasting app you want. Look for Jill McKinley. Look for Jill from the Northwoods. You'll find my podcast there. A Better Life in Small Steps.com is the home 
for all my podcasts. I appreciate you listening and you can always leave messages for me. I hope this is helping in this experience too with Mongero GLP is helping too. I had a lot of questions when I started and so I wanted to do this to maybe start answering questions as I start discovering answers and more questions to some of these things. So have a great week.